Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Vietnam Innovators. Today, joining me at the studio are our two guests on Zoom. Uh, they're calling in from Singapore. We have Praneeth Yandamuri. He's the partner at Bain & Company. Praneeth, welcome to, this, to the show slash virtual studio. And then we also have Dhruv Vora. He is the managing director at Meta. Um, we're bringing the two of them here today on the show because they've got some great insights to share with their sync report which I'll let them explain. Um, and I myself have read the report. It's a fantastic one that shares a lot of insights, not just about Southeast Asia, but precisely about uh, Vietnam as well, and why we all should be a little bit more bullish, even though some macro conditions may say otherwise. Praneeth and Dhruv, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining uh, this morning from Singapore. Thank you, Hal. Pleasure to be here. Look forward to it. Thanks, Hal. Praneeth, why don't we just start with you? Uh, we'll love to hear about what you do at uh, Bain & Company exactly. And then same question to, to Drew right after. Sure, Hal. Um, at Bain, how I am a partner based in Singapore, but I do work across um, Southeast Asia. I predominantly focus on consumer products and retail businesses and advising my clients to create better value. So I work across the whole spectrum of um, corporates trying to do corporate ventures, insurgent brands, incumbent brands, so what you have, um, both with MNCs and local companies. And specifically, um, Drew and I are co-authors for this report that's been in the running for the last four years. What we do together every year is come together and look at what are the digital consumer trends that are happening in Southeast Asia, how is the market evolving, how is consumer behavior evolving, and more importantly, what the implications are for brands. Excellent. Thank you, Praneeth. Uh, Drew, over to you. Quick intro. Hi, my name is Dhruv. Uh, I lead the mid-market teams for the business teams at Meta for Southeast Asia, uh, which basically means that I manage our relationships with small and medium businesses, uh, VCs, startups. And as you know, this is a thriving ecosystem of all sorts of businesses. So it's an absolute privilege to be in this role. Just prior to this, I used to manage our relationships with e-commerce, tech, and telecom players. Uh, this is a fast-growing ecosystem. And I get the opportunity to interact with many businesses, inter interesting people like you, How, uh, and I'm really looking forward to chatting with you today. Excellent. Let me just start by saying to the audience too how privileged we are to have the both of you here on the show today. It's only going to be about 45 minutes or however long we talk for, but it really is a mini MBA. So for those of you listening in, um, it's going to be a fun one. Uh, let me start with Dhruv. Uh, let's get straight into it. Of course, we're here, or I'm calling from Vietnam. You guys cover Asia Pacific, but from what I understand, Vietnam is very much on top of your minds for not only the uh, Asia Pacific, but the world actually, in terms of engagement and opportunities here. Let's talk about how Vietnamese consumers have changed on meta platforms over the past 12 months, let's say. How, how have things evolved for you guys? Well, uh, let me just take a step back here. And if you just think of the year that we are in, this is one of the most uncertain times that we've experienced. So on one hand, we're coming out of the pandemic. And then on the other, there's almost a recession. And we probably are in a recession right now. Uh, there's a war going on. There's inflation. There is a supply chain issue. So a bunch of things happening at the same time. What we have found despite that is Southeast Asia, especially Vietnam, is emerging quite resilient through these tough times. So there is a speed bump right now where all of us are sort of trying to figure out what the next 12 months will look like. Put this to context, when the pandemic happened, 70 million new people in Southeast Asia became first-time digital consumers. So this meant that people could buy or sell a service online, and 70 million is more than the population of all of the UK. And this happened just when the pandemic started, because obviously a lot of us were locked down, our consumer behavior changed significantly to online. Now, you would have expected that once things open up and we're in the post-pandemic reality, some of this behavior would reverse. Uh, but what's, what we found is that while the total value of goods and services bought online in total has actually fallen. So remember this doubled when the pandemic started. Now we are finding it sort of growing at uh, a slower pace. Vietnam is actually the healthiest growth rate. So we expect Vietnam's online e-commerce GMV to grow at about 28% annual growth rate until 2027. Uh, but we're finding that the number of categories that people purchase online is still the same the value that a person spends online is actually increased. In Vietnam, it's gone from $45 per basket to 50, but the frequency has gone down. So what this means uh, is that, look, if I started buying groceries online for the first time when the pandemic started, 
I'm still continuing to do that. So people still buy in Vietnam eight categories online, which is as much as last year. But if I bought groceries online five times, I'm probably buying them four times online now because things are open, so I like to go to the store. But this is still really interesting when you put it in the context of the world. Uh, despite the fact the pandemic's ended and people are venturing out, the behavioral change on buying commerce online, the number of categories people buy, the faith that they have in doing this, the convenience of doing this is still consistent. And we find that really fascinating. Right. So even on our platforms, uh, that's the sort of behavior we're seeing. 80 percent of the people in Vietnam would uh, still depend on online platforms for influence. Uh, most of them discover products online. Uh, video and business messaging are two emerging trends. We can go into depth at some point in the recording. But that's that's the basic nutshell that, look, things haven't reversed completely to pre pandemic times. There are certain behavioral changes that happened during the pandemic. Some changes have slowed down, but overall, uh, the shift to e-commerce and online is here to stay. Excellent. Thank you, Drew, for sharing that. It sounds like the overarching theme here is resiliency is, is still very much uh, present in Vietnam. Uh, but when it comes to consumer trends, they've they've adapted. Um, Praneeth, I'm, I'm assuming you have the same sentiment um, uh, as a co-author of Sync, of course, and working with Drew for many years. Uh, I'd love to hear your comments on how important is Vietnam to the overall growth of the region. Of course, you know, Drew works at Meta, he's seeing it from the platform side, but from, from your overarching, you know, reach across all these consumer industries, what are, what are you seeing? How, how important is Vietnam to these critical companies that operate across the region? Absolutely, How It's a great question. Um, in one word, super, super critical. And I'm personally very bullish on Vietnam, having lived in Ho Chi Minh City for three years, uh, running a business there, not not so uh, in the distant past. One is, it, it's got a decent, in a Southeast Asia context, it's got a decent consumer base of 90 million people growing fast. And with the GDP per capita going up, most of the consuming class uh, will come and show their weight in the domestic market. So that's one. Number two is, as companies start looking to diversify their supply chain bases, given geopolitical issues, conflict-related issues, and so on, supply chains which were previously optimized for efficiency or cost savings will now also be optimized for security of supply. Given that Vietnam is a very good base for a lot of companies to look to diversify the supply chain bases, so from that perspective, I do expect Vietnam uh, to gain. Number three is the talent that Vietnam has, both for blue collared workers and white collared workers. Companies are finding that the cost of production is quite uh, attractive, uh, again, and the availability of talent is definitely there um, for them to sort of flourish their uh, companies and so on and so forth. Uh, so from a lot of these perspectives, and given that Vietnam will grow at a healthy clip, Companies are looking to establish and grow their businesses at a one and a half to two times the clip of the growth of the GDP. If you take the example of Samsung, I mean, it's uh, Vietnam is a huge export hub for them. Um, so long story short, domestic consumer base, a good recipient of supply chain diversification, availability of both blue collar and white collar talent, successful examples of companies which have leveraged Vietnam uh, for exports and so on and so forth. So. Uh, I think if you look at the Southeast Asia landscape, Vietnam is definitely super important uh, from both the growth, growth standpoint, but also from a, a manufacturing based standpoint. Excellent. Um, for those listeners tuning in today, you might be wondering how Vietcetera is doing as well. You know, we're getting expert advice from Dhruv and Praneeth here, um, our, our 80 person team in uh, Ho Chi Minh City and Hanoi. Pretty much the same narrative that Praneeth and, and Drew are sharing. Um, things are good. We're resilient, but there are some headwinds. Uh, how can we be prepared for that? Um, that's from a small business perspective. For those of you wondering, Drew, Praneeth, thank you for sharing. Uh, guys, we're going to move over to um, today's uh, topic, which we really want to kind of uh, drill down into, which is the SYNC Southeast Asia report. Um, I understand this is a co-joint authored report that's been five years in the making. I'm sure some of you uh, that are listening in and tuning in aren't familiar with what SYNC is. Hence today's show, we're here to, to kind of introduce a little bit. Um, I'm going to start with Praneeth kind of sharing, you know, what is the report exactly and, and what prompted the collaboration? And then Drew, I'll ask you right after, what are some of the, the highlights from that report? So Praneeth, starting with you, um, what is it? Uh, what is this report and how did the collaboration start? 
Absolutely. How? I mean, if you look at the Southeast Asia landscape, and not just Southeast Asia, if you look at across the world, digitization has grown exponentially. In fact, uh, we use the word moonshot. If you look at any digital um, company's growth, uh, especially over the last five to 10 years, these are moonshots, essentially, right? Uh, the kind of disruption that's happened and affected every industry. Um, I mean, I'll give you an example. I mean, who imagined 10 years ago that you could actually order your taxi sitting in your house through an app? Who, who imagined that you would actually go on a vacation and sleep on somebody else's couch? Uh, who thought that you could one day not carry your wallet and your phone becomes more important than your wallet? So the pace of disruption that digitization has brought about is phenomenal. What Drew and I wanted to do through this report was to profile exactly what are these changes that are happening specifically in Southeast Asia and double click on that specifically in each of the markets. So the way we go about doing this is um, we run an interview uh, with about 30, 40, 50 uh, thought leaders in the industry coming from varied backgrounds. These could be founders of digital insurgent companies. These could be established incumbent brands. These could be people who are uh, in the policy making and so on and so forth. Uh, so we gather their points of view. We also do very deep consumer surveys. We reach out between 15,000 to 20,000 consumers across the markets of Southeast Asia. And we have a very detailed questionnaire which asks them, uh, asks them to introspect how their behavior has been, both in terms of media consumption, in their path to purchase, how they discover brands, how do they use certain brands or websites, what makes them switch, and so on and so forth. So those two, plus um, the expertise that both Meta and Bain have in this field, all these three combined together is what you see in the report. So that's the, basically the genesis. Having done a few of these, um, people started expecting us to come up with this report every year. They look forward to what's happening, what's the latest and the greatest. So when COVID happened, we profiled how COVID has changed consumer behavior rapidly. I mean, that was an year where e-commerce GMV, for example, uh, more than doubled uh, for some of the categories, in fact, tripled or quadrupled for categories like grocery because people were consuming at home uh, and so on and so forth. So if you look at the key highlights from this year's report, and I'll let the readers sort of, uh, or viewers of your podcast uh, read through the report if they have the time, is uh, one is we talk about e-commerce GMV. We, we go into the detail in Vietnam. Um, as Drew was mentioning, while it slowed down compared to previous year, it's, it's, a, it's still at a very healthy clip of about, uh, um, about 20% uh, growth. Uh, the slowdown is just a speed bump. The purchase frequency remains high. The basket size is, continues to uh, increase and so on and so forth. The digital consumers in Vietnam continue to be omni-channel. Uh, so you need an integrated marketing approach because they may see a brand online, uh, read reviews online, but go to a shop, browse it, but then come back uh, offline, that is, and then come back online and uh, and make the purchase because they may find the SKU and the color and whatever you have um, uh, available online, right? Uh, discovery continues to remain very critical. If you think of brands or categories as planned purchases versus impulsive purchases, especially most of the categories that are impulse, these consumers have become more discerning. They get hooked onto a certain brand because it pops up, the brand, in, brand engages with them, and then that's how they make a purchase. So it's not necessarily uh, a planned purchase. Consumers continue to be promiscuous, so you have to really up your game uh, in providing them the right offering and service and so on and so forth. Um, so it basically goes into the depth of how consumers are behaving, how e-commerce platforms are doing, and what what's happening with e-commerce GMB, and 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 ends up with what the implications are. Well, guys, you listened. Uh, you just heard it from Praneet himself. Uh, this has been five years in the making. Every year, we're kind of expecting it. So hopefully, we have Praneet on the podcast next year as well when the next report comes out. Um, maybe I'm being a bit preemptive there, but Praneet, you heard it from me. Uh, Drew. Uh, over to you. Um, what are some of the key highlights? What are some some metrics that you want to share and, and takeaways and um, and more precisely uh, from that report? Where does Vietnam stand? Yeah, how? Let me let me take you through that. But let me also quickly reflect on what Pranit's mentioned about sync and the way we do this every year. One of the really interesting things about Vietnam and Southeast Asia is that two simultaneous trends happen at the same time. The first is that more and more people come onto the internet and start becoming first-time digital consumers, right? Now, that also happens in India. It also happens in China. 
but it does not happen in say the US or EMEA where everybody who needs to be on the internet is already on the internet, right? And then the second simultaneous trend is that the existing people on the internet buy more and more. So their basket size continues to increase. For example, like I shared, Vietnam's basket size grew from 45 to 50. Now that sort of trend happens in the US, but it does because people start using Amazon more and more, for example, but it's certainly not happening in India and other countries, right? So these two trends, new people coming online and buying and existing people buying more and more happen simultaneously in Southeast Asia, right? And that makes it such an exciting region to study because there are so many different pivots. Add to that the fact that we are a very experimental population. So in Vietnam, more than 50% of the people have switched a brand that they've bought previously in the last year. So what this does is that in addition of all this growth, people are also experimental. So it gives an opportunity to more and more SMBs, more and more startups. Add to that the fact that the VC investments are all in this region. And then add right. further that we are reaping some of the benefits of a slight slowdown in China. Right. So a lot of companies are moving out and they're establishing offices, guess where, in Vietnam. So all of this makes it so exciting to study. Five years back, we were talking about a rising middle class. Now we are talking about a Vietnamese population that just adopts future of tech like nobody's business. Right. Uh, and, and that to me is really exciting. So in this report, the key highlights for me are, I think Praneet called out a few of them. The first is that, look, there's a speed bump and there's going to be a lot of noise around, hey, what's happening in the online world? right in the next one year it's just a speed bump so the long-term opportunity in sea actually outpaces and is is, is more than the short-term uncertainties there'll be 51 million new households we are the youngest population there'll be new middle class emerging there'll be more startup investments right so stay on course long-term opportunity is is awesome the second is that this whole behavior of moving online and then offline a long time back, we would talk about, hey, what's happening? Are people researching online, buying offline? Are people going to the mall and evaluating a product and then buying it online? All of this is now a mesh. So there's just an integrated channel experience now. So you might want to search for a new pair of sneakers online. You might want to order it and you might want to go collect it from the store and use like your e-wallet to pay for it. So there are so many digital touch points and offline touch points at the same point and at the same time. And we sort of highlighted that in the second section of the report. Uh, and then what we're finding is new ways of engagement. So we're seeing messaging. Uh, a lot of businesses are using that, especially in Vietnam. So Vietnam leads the business messaging revolution where people are just buying and selling stuff on WhatsApp, Instagram, Direct, and Messenger. Uh, there's a huge behavior on video. And video is certainly the thing that holds all of these integrated channel experiences together. So if you're a brand or a company and you want to engage with your consumers, how do you do it? podcasts like you're doing this how or you do a video like the zoom recording that we're doing right now these are two ways a brand can engage with their consumers right don't forget uh real squad as well as well yeah i mean reels <laughs> is just on fire like short form video is the way to go right like everybody's just uh that's that's the way people are engaging with each other and yeah and then there's the future of tech we found that uh People in Southeast Asia are ready for the next wave of tech. I just want to quickly share some Vietnam specific stats with you. More than 50% of the people in Vietnam have actually used the fintech product, which is a huge number. More than 35 have used health tech and ed tech, so disruptive health and disruptive education. More than 70% of the people we surveyed said they were interested in the metaverse and have used one related product, like an NFT or crypto or e wallets or anything that's like disruptive. Vietnam is one of the highest interest rates in crypto and AR and VR, both above 30%. So very excited about this. And then the last section is about disruption and what you need to do to take a future back look. So uh, I encourage everybody to look at that because there's some implications. So these are the highlights. I think the future of tech is really the highlight for me and the fact that we are resilient, more resilient than any other region uh, in the world. And Vietnam sort of leads this behavior. I'll just leave you with two Vietnam specific stats again. Uh, out of all the countries in Southeast Asia, the CAGR for Vietnam e-commerce by the time it's 2027 will be the highest. It'll probably, Vietnam will be almost as big as Thailand and bigger than Philippines in terms of online commerce. 
and the growth of online retail as a percentage of all retail. So you, you could buy retail in a mall, uh, you could buy it at a store, right? And you could also buy online. But the growth of the online component, even this year, is the highest in Vietnam out of all other Southeast Asian countries. So Vietnam clearly leads in some of these behavioral shifts. Drew, when you're sharing these statistics, you know, it goes back to almost like 20 years ago when I feel like some of these uh, tech founders like a, like a Jeff Bezos at Amazon was saying, he was hearing these reports that the, the internet was growing this much and he was like, I got to start an e-commerce company, right? And uh, I feel like some of these stats you're sharing to our audience um, will hopefully motivate some of them uh, to start small businesses and eventually bigger ones themselves. Um, thank you for sharing those stats, Drew. I really appreciate it, especially those Vietnam-specific ones. Uh, Pranit, I have a follow-up for you about that. Uh, you know, I'd love, I'd love for you, you know, really great statistics, Drew, but what are some of the similarities and differences between Vietnam and other Southeast Asian markets and create those trends that you and Drew have, have both observed? I, is it just like the water that people are drinking here that's somehow powering their, their growth? Or is it, um, you lived here yourself, so you, you probably would know, uh, maybe the water does have something here. What are those differences um, and those trends that you guys are observing or similarities? I think how it's, if you look across Southeast Asia, especially the key themes that Drew and I have touched upon, there's more similarities than differences, to be honest. Um, especially Vietnam is coming off a smaller base in terms of absolute e-commerce GMV size. But if you look at the growth rates, it's it's pretty large. Now, if you look at just absolute size uh, on e-commerce GMV, Indonesia is the biggest by virtue of having 250 million people versus 90 million people of Vietnam. But uh, if you look at the growth rates, again, Vietnam's growing at a very high clip. Um, if you look at some of the trends that Drew and I have highlighted, which is discovering brands, usage of short form video to engage with brands. If you look at the omni-channel behavior or uh, the need for in integrated marketing to reach out to these individuals, most of them are quite similar uh, across Southeast Asia. Uh, yes, yeah, some markets like Singapore are more advanced in terms of uh, some of the metaverse kind of adoption behaviors. But otherwise, if you look at the themes that were highlighted in the report, you, you find more similarities and differences. What are those differences, though, the ones that, that do exist in, in your experience, having worked in a Vietnam, for instance, if you could point even just one or a couple? Yeah, I should take a pause here because I don't really know if there are differences <laughs> through to you. Okay. Maybe yeah, that's yeah, the question. Yeah, you, know. Um, you know, one thing, how is that the internet has basically created a democracy. So what we're finding is that in Southeast Asia, if you're an 18 year old in Manila versus Ho Chi Minh versus uh, Bangkok, your aspirations and your ability to engage on the internet and especially on social media is, is basically the same. So people are aspiring to live the same life, they have the same ambitions, they have the same dreams, mm -hmm. right? The X factor for Vietnam really is the ability to adapt very fast, right? So a lot of a lot of creator ecosystem that we're seeing there, if you think of business messaging, right? We found that in Vietnam, 22% uh, of the people we surveyed, which is the highest again, said that, look, we want to communicate with a business on WhatsApp or Messenger. We're very happy to have a conversation have a social experience in doing that and taking the punt and buying, right? That is a behavior that's sort of, it's, it's led by Vietnam, right? You mentioned Reels, short form video. It's, it's, it's one of the highest adopters of short form video. There are a lot of creativity in the creator ecosystem and we're trying to work very closely with the creator ecosystem. There are amazing businesses such as yours, how, like, you know, like for, for, uh, for what you do, it's probably one of the biggest, most sort of famous podcasts in Southeast Asia, right? So if you take your own example, it's just what happens in Vietnam happens first. And then like a lot of people in Southeast Asia follow that. So just the ability to innovate and then grow fast, right? Uh, that's that's unique to Vietnam. At least that's, that's my opinion. But overall, it's created a democracy, right? Like all of us are able to access the same system. And, and and have the same aspirations, they're exposed to the same sort of content, the same brands, and e-commerce and, uh, and the online world has made it equally mm -hmm. accessible to everyone. Drew, I have a follow-up question for you. Uh, I'm sure you're asked this question um, here and there, internally, externally, 
and that is that of the platform explosion. In the last two years, there have been a number of competitors uh, encroaching on Meta's territory. You guys are really the dominant player here, but uh, you know, let's not batter on the bush here. You, you guys have a few competitors and you're adapting fast and ever to, to maintain that innovation. What are you guys doing to keep those digital you know, savvy consumers and, and shoppers on Facebook, Instagram, and, and WhatsApp? What are you guys doing um, in the region and perhaps in Vietnam? You mentioned creators, for instance. I'm sure that's one. Yeah. Well, you know how one of the beautiful things about being in Southeast Asia is that it's not a zero-sum game, right? So when I first moved here, and I think I moved here in 2015, 2016, uh, since then, the number of internet users has almost doubled, right? And we've still not scratched the surface. If you think of Indonesia for a second, uh, there are probably, you know, we haven't even, they're not even, right now, eight in 10 people actually shop online, but the retail penetration is just about, like in Southeast Asia overall, it ranges between six to 8%. In China, 35% of all retailers bought online. So there is so much to do. We think ourselves, uh, think of ourselves as an ecosystem partner. We're really not thinking about, you know, we really certainly don't think that people are encroaching or we're encroaching on anybody's territory. We think it's just a huge opportunity in Southeast Asia for everybody to work together in a partner ecosystem and grow it, right? And, and it eventually helps communities and societies. I want to use an analogy, actually. Um, just pause there for a second. Um, you know, people think of a pie. And uh, you take a piece of the pie, but it sounds like you're determined to grow the pie rather than just take a piece. Because the pie is just growing, right? We're just getting started in this region. Uh, Praneet shared some stats about the GDP, the per capita income growth, the rising middle class, right? So over time, I think for the next decade, this is Southeast Asia's decade. Uh, If you think of right now in China, more than 60% of all consumer electronics are bought online. Our ratios are much lower, right? So we we still have to get there. Our logistics system will improve. Our payment ecosystem will improve. The regulation will improve. Uh, interoperability will improve. So really, like like you've correctly pointed out to your analogy, like the pie just is going to grow, right, for the next 10 years. But one of the things that we're finding is that as more and more people come online, uh, and in Vietnam, we surveyed, at least the Vietnam survey said that, 60% of the people who are online are willing to buy something, but they're not sure of exactly what. And they, right, they, 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 they've sort of adapted to buying online, but they're very happy to discover things, right? They, they look at eight different platforms uh, that has actually doubled this year. And, they, and this is something that we call discovery commerce. So essentially, if you wanna, like I, I really wanted to figure out how to buy some running shoes. I was on Instagram, I found like, a running shoe that's that, that that's you know that that could suit me and i get influenced to buy it and then i'll research about it it's very simple for me to do that by just whatsapping the seller having a conversation then i can go to the store so we call it discovery commerce and our tools enable small brands and people who want to buy those brands to come together in a seamless automated way right now that is a pretty unique offering that we have a uh, long time back, if I wanted to buy shoes, I would just search, right? And I would see like what are the results and buy it. Now I'm really open to discovery and influence. And then when I'm evaluating, I'm using business messaging and we, we have like WhatsApp to do that. And I'm using video essentially to get influence for what I want to do. So that's like from the consumer side of things, right? To give you the stats, 80% of the people still get influenced on what they want to buy online. Out of that half, in the discovery stages on social media. On evaluation, the primary way of evaluating is social media. In it, the fastest growing is messaging. And then when you want to buy, you're buying on an e-commerce platform or on social commerce, right? So my journey will be find something on Instagram, evaluate it on messaging or whichever way I want to talk to my friends about it, then probably go to Shopee or Lazada and try to buy it, right? Uh, maybe so, so, so that's the journey and, and we enable tools and products to make that happen. Amazing. I love the, the term discovery shopping. Um, I, I just have to say it because I just uh, ran upon it the last couple of nights ago. I was on Instagram 
And Instagram's full of these really funny memes these days. And the meme was, uh, you know, late at night, you're opening your refrigerator and you're, you're, you don't really know what you're looking for, but you're going to discover something in there, um, even if you're not hungry. Um, but just the appeal and the, the discovery element um, will get people excited, right? Um, and I think that's what um, the platforms at Meta are doing. So thank you. I just had to share that analogy. I was thinking about that. Praneeth, over to you next. Um, I want to talk, you know, everything sounds really great. Let's talk about some of the challenges and headwinds facing e-commerce. Um, according to the Sync report and according to the, uh, your team here, it sounds like the consumer's level of satisfaction has dropped significantly this year. Uh, we talk about inflation, supply chain issues. In fact, the net promoter score is down to 35%, which is an 18% decline. That's massive. For any business to suffer that much, or industry rather, um, it's something to watch out for. Uh, Vietnam's is 41, a bit higher than the the regional average, but it's dropped as well from 65%. Uh, what are those factors that have contributed to the decline and, and what do these e-commerce players um, and small businesses have to look out for? Absolutely, Hal. Look, I mean, these are teething problems. The industry has done very well, uh, as Ruth said, in terms of setting up enablers, e-commerce enablers, uh, as these grew rapidly. I mean, be it last mile logistics, be it certainty of delivery date and time scheduling, be it uh, quality of product assurance uh, uh, through returns and so on and so forth, be it offering cash and delivery, but also alternate payment mechanisms as e-wallets grow or credit card penetration grow in these markets. What's happened after the pandemic is essentially a few things that consumers tell us. Um, one is availability of product, right? Uh, you could look for a certain SKU and you would find that more often than not, the proportion of out-of-stock SKUs has gone up just because of supply mm. challenges that uh, people have faced with. Add to that the usual things around, uh, look, I haven't gotten my product on time because of logistics uh, delays and so on and so forth, created that kind of uh, dissonance uh, with the consumers because the expectation was quite mile high uh, to begin with. But I'm very sure that given the magnitude of investment that's going into the space, around e-commerce enablers itself, right? Uh, be it penetration of e-wallets, be it better logistics or last mile fulfillment services, even things like agencies which manage a brand's communication online on e-commerce platforms, uh, agencies that take over your headache of everything that's operational would enable a brand that's never been in Vietnam to use these agencies to sort of um, thought to finish kind of services. Uh, will massively help the sector grow. So while there's been a speed bump again, um, I think those are temporary. Uh, I'm sure as consolidation also c commences in the industry, these emerging winners will do well to get those service levels up. But you also have to bear in mind, like in every industry, once you set a standard, uh, you'll have to keep improving on that because people start getting very discerning. So the standards get pretty high. Yeah, I, I would have to agree there. The standards are high and they've been met, but they've been... Um, consistently, I guess you could say, off the mark in the past year. I, I've, I've experienced that myself as a consumer, and um, these businesses are just getting back on their feet, right, after uh, a pretty tough few months, and let's hopefully things change quickly. The next thing um, I like to do is, because this is an, a mini MBA of sorts, and the, the Sync report is a, a bit of a teaser, and both of you are quite senior at what you do and, and, and uh, are experts in the field, so I'd like to um, take this opportunity to Hire you, Praneeth, for you know five minutes, and and you, Drew, as well. Uh, what are your recommendations? I know Bain is usually quite um, protective of their recommendations for your clients, but you know for our listeners here, uh, let's open the doors a little bit. Praneeth, recommendations. What would, what would you have to share to the brands and advertisers and e-commerce uh, players out there? What do you have to share? Let me start with the brands first. Um, I think if you're a brand, um, stay the course. Um, Southeast Asia and Vietnam in particular offers tremendous opportunity. Uh, I think if you're solving for the short term, 2022, 2023 are bumpy years for a number of companies, supply issues, inflation issues, so on and so forth. But stay the course. I mean, the, the dividends that you will reap if you take a 10-year view to this region will be phenomenal. Uh, I think just a demographic dividend, right? I mean, China is going to lose a few millions of people from the working class just because of the population pyramid. All of that gains will, uh, all of the losses will be gained by Southeast Asia. So long story short, stay the course in Southeast Asia. Number two is the way you do advertising or the way you interact with the brand, be it your above the line budgets or your below the line budgets, you'll have to throw it out of the window, 
right, the legacy way of doing this. You'll have to say, what is your consumer doing as he evaluates your brand and purchases it? Uh, like Dhruv said, it's it's very omni. It's very integrated how the consumer is doing it. It's more complex than ever before. You have uh, AI now suggesting products to you. You have voice recording. You, you'll probably explore brands through the metaverse in the future. So you'll have to say, if I have a dollar, first of all, do I need a dollar or two dollars or half a dollar? Uh, because you can be very, very targeted in your communication once you know your audience profile and so on and so forth. And then what's the best way of spending the dollar? You'll have to take a complete white paper approach to it or a zero-based approach to it. So throw the things out of the window. Number three is a lot of legacy companies are very good with offline execution. So they know if a, if you go to a mom and pop store, what, what should a good mom and pop store look like for your brand? If you go to modern trade, okay, it has to your product has to be at eye level. It has to be, uh, you know, uh, merchandised in a certain way and so on and so forth. But all of that, again, has to be very different in an online world. So what does a perfect online store or a perfect consumer experience looks like online will require you measuring very different set of metrics, uh, looking at data very differently, hiring different capabilities into your organization and the reporting structures within an organization. E-commerce is a very, very different dynamic. In modern trade, for example, uh, in a supermarket, you have to announce your promo calendar at the beginning of the year and you have to book your new product innovation three months in advance. In an, in an online world, you are doing dynamic pricing. Uh, your shares go down, <laughs> you're, you're do, coming up with a promo the next day. So you cannot wait for your boss's boss to approve your budget. So you'll have to have a very dynamic, agile way of working in the organization. So relook at how your organization is wired uh, for this rapid changing world. And then the last but not the least is uh, the last decade was all about supply chain optimization for costs. Uh, I think the next five years is going to be about both costs, but also uh, security of supply. Talent is a big issue. Uh, again, uh, I think for a lot of brands, it's about like consumers are very discerning and discovering the brands. I think talent will also discover the organizations they want to work uh, with. The demands of these uh, so-called coming up talent are very different. The needs for them or what motivates them to go to work are very different. So again, how do organizations sort of rewire themselves uh, will be a phenomenal thing. So that's as far as brands are concerned. But just talking about the opportunity, how we didn't have a chance to talk about it, but very close to my heart of what digitization has done and will continue to do more so in Southeast Asia and in Vietnam in particular is bringing the unserved and the uns underserved into the fore of consumption. I'll give you a couple of examples. We used to have a nanny who used to take care of our kids. Uh, she worked with us for 10 years. She went back to her hometown in Southeast Asia. And thanks to digitization, she's now an English teacher earning a decent living and able to serve her aging parents in her hometown. Digitization has done that for her. I've worked with a client who is trying to digitize farmers. I mean, farmers in Vietnam now on their phone can get advice on crop patterns, advice on weather, advice on nutrients they need to be using, advice on fair prices so that uh, they can have a better deal and so on and so forth. It's empowering them to make better decisions and improving their income levels. So while we think about consumers and all that, there's also this whole underserved and unserved, which never had access to even credit, for example, are now able to get uh, lending facilities. So it's phenomenal. I mean, and, and we are just scratching the surface here. So there are opportunities out there as well. And the choice is too wide. If you're, if you're a student or if you're uh, somebody who's looking out for opportunities, constantly, constantly, constantly upgrade yourself um, and discover, I think is the word for this podcast. So uh, discover what, what, what motivates you, discover, uh, discover the opportunities and probably pave the path uh, to this vast array of opportunities that are out there. Well, those of you listening in, um, those are such valuable sharings from Praneet. Thank you so much, Praneet. Um, big takeaways for me, stay the course. I think that's for, for those of you still building businesses here in Southeast Asia and of course in Vietnam. And I, I love the analogies at the end of um, the discovery of people that may not be using uh, you know, apps or, or platforms as much, but because the last year has enabled them or even forced them to in a good way um, to adopt those platforms, it's given them more opportunities. So stay that course and continue discovering. Uh, Dhruv, over to you next. Um, I'm sure you have a, quite a few uh, recommendations from your of your own, of course, more from the platform side at Meta. Um, please, share away. 
But how actually for me, it's just covered it so beautifully. And then you've obviously also summarized it uh, just the way we want to land the report. Like we, we probably should get you involved really early uh, next year as we do this. <laughs> uh, but, you know, just that, I mean, my closing thought is, and just reflecting again on what Paneet said is just take a future back look on on on, on what you want to do, right? So you, there's one way that you could work, which is like you could you could get a bit overwhelmed by minor shifts. Like, hey, people are now moving a little bit offline. Uh, should I have an offline strategy versus an online? All of that doesn't matter. The experiences are now integrated. Uh, who would have thought that we would be sharing a house uh, via Airbnb, taking a Grab or an Uber to the airport, logging on, teaching English and you know on an ed tech platform, using an e-wallet, not even visiting a bank. I can't remember the last time I visited a bank. These things are really hard to imagine 10 years ago. If you just open your phone right now, look at all the apps you have on it, imagine yourself 10 years ago, you would not have been using them. You would have just been like, hey, what are these apps? And like you, 10 years ago, if somebody told you that these would sort of play the central part of your life, like you, you would not believe it. I, I still think BlackBerry was yesterday. I still have like a really old Nokia phone, which I have like nostalgic value attached to. But just imagine the things that have changed, right? So now, now imagine what will happen 10 years later in the metaverse, uh, in the world of AR and VR, where there'll possibly be a decentralized internet at some stage. You might have crypto, you might have fintech. So what's really important is to not get overwhelmed by aberrations and exceptions in a year to 18 months, which will be challenging. But really think of where the world will be 10 years from now and start planning for that world. And then Praneet cover it, right? Whether it's your operating model, whether it's your talent, whether it's a structure, mm. whether it's your channel strategy, your marketing strategy, all of it. Right. And, and it's an absolute privilege to be part of this ecosystem and especially in Southeast Asia. I think th those are my closing thoughts on, on that question. Cool. So two takeaways for me. Hopefully I'll be involved in the next sync report. <laughs> I think this is a phenomenal report that everyone has to read. So for those of you listening and please download the report, uh, share with your friends, your family, your business partners. Um, a lot of great insights there and hopefully it will spur your own creativity about how to stay the course the next 10 years. Praneet, Drew, thank you so much for sharing your mini MBA crash course today on the Vietnam Innovators podcast. Absolute pleasure. Was awesome. Thank you, Hao. Thank you, guys. Uh, for those of you tuning in, watching our, our show or listening on the podcast, uh, it's been a pleasure for, to have you here. And hopefully you've, you've had your takeaways from uh, these valuable sharings. Again, download the Sync Report. It's available online on the meta platforms, uh, wherever you can find their content. Of course, uh, keep tuning in for Vietnam Innovators. We have great episodes coming up uh, over the course of the next uh few episodes and of course ongoing. Thank you for your support. Praneeth and Drew, thank you so much for your time. Uh, we're going to leave it here. Um, that's about it. Thanks guys. And I'll see you next time. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Vigla Serra Corporation is the largest real estate and building materials group in Vietnam, as well as the largest industrial park operator in Vietnam. 48 years of excellence makes Viglacera a leading full-service provider of sustainable and high-quality building materials. Having a total of 40 subsidiaries, Viglacera covers the entire real estate and building materials spectrum.